This is America and the Courts, C-SPAN's weekly look at the federal judiciary. In this edition, Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals oral arguments in the case of Sea River Maritime Incorporated versus Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta. Then, in about 40 minutes, Chief Justice William Rehnquist delivers the commencement address at Marymount University in Washington, D.C. First, a look at oral arguments in Sea River Maritime versus Mineta. This case centers on the right of the Exxon Valdez to return to Alaska's Prince William Sound, where 11 million gallons of crude oil spilled in 1989. Two years after the accident, Congress passed the Oil Pollution Act, which prohibits any tanker that has spilled one million gallons of oil since 1989 from entering Prince William Sound. Sea River Maritime, a subsidiary of ExxonMobil, argues that the law is unconstitutional. The case reached the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals from the U.S. District Court in Alaska. A three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard the case on April 3rd in Seattle. This court now resumes its session. Please be seated. Yes, our last and final case on today's calendar is Sea River Maritime Financial versus Norman Manette. Okay, please report. Yes. Bruce, I hope to preserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal. Just keep track of your, keep an eye on the clock there. On March 22, 1989, in section 2737, which triggers the exclusion from Prince William Sound, the vessels that are still more than one million gallons of oil, identifies the Exxon Valdez with laser-like precision and defeats the government's attempts to dream up post hoc regulatory justifications for the statute. Whether this court uh, approaches this case through our little attainder argument or our argument under uh, the due process and the protection clause. Would you still have a bill of attainder argument if the date were March 2nd? There would still be March 2nd instead of... March 2nd instead of March uh, 22. Well, that wouldn't have affected it. What, what March 22 does is exclude at least four other U.S. flag vessels that have spilled the one million gallons of oil in the uh, preceding 15 years, as we've explained in our brief. You would even have such an argument if there were no trigger date at all, because uh, bill of attainders offend fundamental principles of separation of powers by focusing on past conduct and by in doing so identifying specific classes that have uh, the object of uh, Congress's attention. But the trigger date makes it sharper and clearer. It brings this case within uh, really the same framework as this court's decision in Ford's Cove, where you also had dates that only pinpointed one piece of litigation. Let me briefly just follow up then. Suppose Congress passed a statute forbidding all oil tankers that had ever spilled one million gallons of oil from operating on Prince William Sound. Would that be? It could be. I'm not saying it's not. But what I am saying here is that that's not what Congress did, and we know why it did what it did, because it was focusing on the Exxon Valdez. Uh, and that's what that's the vessel that it did not want to remove from Prince William Sound. The government's argument that this statute can be saved because it's open. Before you get into the substance of your argument, I, I, there's one thing I'd like for you to clarify for me, if you can, and that is this. What, what's significant about American flag ships? as opposed to any other ships? Well, as a general matter, under the Jones Act, for the coastal trade from the Port of Valdez down to the refineries in California, where this oil is landed, or Puget Sound, where it's landed, they have to be U.S. flag. The only exception was... So no other, no other ships can go into the Sound except... To, to, to take A&S oil out of the Sound. And that's the only reason to go there. You can, you can bring freight in from Japan, but the only vessels that can be used in that coastal trade are U.S. flag vessels. That's why that's so important. All right. The government's attempt to say that uh, this is an open-ended, ever-expanding class is refuted on a variety of grounds. In the first place, here now, 11 years after the statute was adopted, the, U, uh, the Exxon Valdez remains the only U.S. flag vessel affected by it. Secondly, the law is very clear that the prospective operation of the statute cannot save its retroactive application in the circumstances that we have here. The Brown case, the Chief Justice uh, Lawrence opinion there makes that clear. Words code does for that matter. 
the government's focus on a handful of foreign flag vessels that had spilled the record of quantity of oil between that trigger date and the date of that 15 months later is wholly beside the point. None of those vessels ever had or would be used to develop these trades. This court had it exactly right in the first uh, visit that we've had, where it said the Exxon Valdez is virtually the only ship in the world affected by the legislation. Uh, on this basis, we submit it's quite clear that the singling out requirement has been met. So the next issue How about the punishment? Is it punishment? The government says it's not punishment because the statute does not affect uh, banishment within the historical meaning of that word, nor does it bar people from their chosen employments for reasons of political belief. And that's true to an extent. It is a banishment of a sort, but not like banishment historically at common law. But that misses the point. As the Supreme Court held in Nixon, you must look, the courts must look beyond mere historical experience. And the court went on to say in the selective service system, the courts must ensure the legislature has not created an impermissible penalty previously held to be, uh, not held to be within the prescription against those of attainder. It also said, for that same reason, the severity of the sanction is not determinative of its character as punishment. Now this approach to the statutes that single out uh, individuals, companies, uh, what have you, is absolutely essential to achieve the separation of powers or to ensure the separation of powers principles that are inherent in both of attainder. Again, uh, uh, the Brown case, the language is powerful and directly on point here. This is from page 442, the Brown opinion. It's not a narrow technical prohibition. Rather, it's an implementation of separation of powers, a general safeguard against legislative exercise of the judicial function or simply trial by legislature. These precepts make it essential that courts look beyond the old historical and recognize punishment in a new family way. That's where the CDC certainly These same principles require that the courts take a hard look at the purported bona fide uh, justification for the statute. Uh, this key, seems to me, in the modern case law, to be the one that most courts have focused on in making this critical decision, and we do have single out. It was said in the Nixon case at page 466, where such legitimate purposes do not appear, it is reasonable to conclude that punishment was intended. Well, you know, the legislative, it appears, one, one could, and I think the government argues this, that what the legislation was designed to accomplish was uh, attempting to avoid future oil okay. spills. That's Why isn't that a legitimate governmental purpose? Well, I'll, I'll give you a variety of answers sure. to that. I first want you to remind you, as, as I know the court knows, this is pure speculation by the Justice Department. I'm not criticizing them, but I'm making the point that there's not a whisper, there's not a hint, there's nothing in the legislative history that supports it. Secondly, I ask you to put yourself in the shoes of the seats of uh, members of Congress and the Senate from the states of Washington and California, for example. If you thought that these vessels were unsafe, would it have been okay to send them into Puget Sound with this oil? Would it have been okay to bring them to San Francisco Bay with this oil? Of course not. More importantly, there is no way in the world, the government hasn't even attempted this, to justify this March 22 date, this March 22, 1989 trigger date. If these vessels were unsafe, but because they had spilled a lot of oil in the past, how in the world you adopted a statute that would let all the others that have U.S. flight vessels capable of going in the first place. There's no way in the world you could do that. In addition, there are other parts of the statute that refute this theory. For example, Congress expressly addressed the issue of tanker design and tanker safety within the statute. It prescribed a, 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 a schedule for double hulling. It's not a whisper about you should be aware of prior spills. In the same way, Congress didn't disturb in any way or even give any informal guidance in the form of legislative history to the Department of Transportation, Coast Guard, who was in charge of deciding what is safe and what is not safe. And as a result, as the court knows, the Exxon Valdez was certified continuously for service after it was repaired and is seaworthy for all purposes all over the world. 
Now, the government, and this gets to your question, Judge Pius, a little more directly. The government's indulging really in a kind of speculation that courts do under ordinary garden variety, equal protection or due process cases, where the statutes are applied prospectively. The reason I submit that the courts do that is to assure that the courts don't breach the separation of powers by using the due process and equal protection clause, as the courts did in the early part of the 20th century to second-guess Congress and infuse their own views of policy through the Constitution. That came to an end with the end of the old guard court. Here, the separation of power principle is exactly the other way around. The courts are protecting the judicial system from Congress's assuming the judicial function of punishment. And to do that, the courts take a hard look. And the modern cases go through the legislative history, and they look at what is tendered from the legislative history. In Nixon, for example, the court said it was readily apparent from the legislative history and quoted it. In selective service, the court said there was convincing support. In Ward's Cove, this court said it could see that the purpose was to relieve the cameras of the cost of additional litigation. In the Bell cases, it was said to be both convincing evidence by the D.C. Circuit and the legislative record was quite clear in the Fifth Circuit. Here, the legislative record doesn't support it at all. In fact, if you think about the most authoritative part of the legislative record, which is the plain language of the statute, that March 22, 1989 date speaks volumes. The fact that there's no other legislative history about 2737 is a result of the 11-hour tactic, and I'm not criticizing Senator Stevens. This happens every day in Congress. But it's a result of the fact that this was put in in a Congress report so that it was not debated on the floor of the House. There's no report language. But surely— Well, the report was debated on the floor, wasn't it? But not this provision. But the entire conference committee— There were broad statements about protecting Prince William Sound, with which nobody disagrees. Certainly, I don't disagree, but none of them explain it. Well, then it's not much of a jump for the government to argue that if Congress was concerned about protecting Prince William Sound, that the purpose of this provision was to further that objective. Well, you could always say that. You could have said the same thing if they had said Exxon Corporation may never again operate Prince William Sound. You could say that they had said, you know, vessels painted red may not operate Prince William Sound. We want to protect Prince William Sound. The real question is, how does this mechanism do it? And it does it only through this invented idea from the Justice Department that somehow a prior spill is a good proxy for rehabilitation of a vessel. Well, the record does show that members of Congress, in discussing the conference committee report, expressed concern about the number of oil spills across the nation, including Exxon Valdez, and concern about the safety of foreign flag vessels in U.S. waters. That goes back to Judge Pius' question about— That is correct. And the rag—this is the government's argument about the rash of spills. The world trade, the American trade, the world prodigy, various other vessels that had spilled some oil in the preceding few months. Those vessels did—those U.S. flag vessels didn't spill a million barrels of oil, a million gallons of oil. They were totally unaffected by this. There was one vessel that had spilled more than a million in that era. It was the Mega Orca, a foreign vessel that had never gone to Prince William Sound and never would. They weren't addressing that problem. They were doing one thing, one thing only. And Senator Stevens, in his candid remark, quoted by the press, said, the reason for this is that people of Alaska don't want the Valdez back. Now, I'm not asking this court to rely on something that a senator said was quoted in the press. I'm not tendering that as legislative history. I am saying to you, though, that he was only being candid and verifying what anybody can see. And that is, 2737 was this date that fingers so clearly the Exxon Valdez was designed to exclude the Valdez from Alaska because of Alaska's hostility toward the vessel. And it's up to you. If I might, I'd like to say a little bit about the Fifth Amendment argument before I turn it down. Because it's really a companion of this argument. We're talking here about 
what is clearly retroactive legislation. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address it right now. Uh, this court's opinion, and I think I'm going to correct it, Judge Nelson, more than half caught, caught KSCH, uh, says this as to testing the circuit. It's whether the new provision attaches new legal consequences to events completed before its enactment. That's from page uh, 786 of the top of the The court went on to say that barring a person, Mr. Cobb, from trading for the rest of his life increases the consequences of his pre act conduct, and thus the statute is retroactive. Uh, that's exactly what we have here. We clearly have retroactive activity. Now, when you do, the prospective justifications that are sufficient in most cases no longer become sufficient. The courts, this is, the government concedes this in the pension benefits case, the courts must take a separate look at the retroactive piece and ask themselves whether or not that can be supported on a rational basis. And the retroactive piece here is integrally, indeed, it's a feature of it, an acceptable feature of it, that condemns this process and the protection concepts that they're in the Fifth Amendment is that March 22, 1989 date, and there's no justification for it. Now, I, I conclude... The justification would be a rational basis for trying to protect Prince William Sound. If that were a rational basis, you say that is what is absent here in the evidence. But that's absent because of the, of the March 22 trigger date. If, if that were the purpose, then there's a, you, you would not have been selected and said, well, it's okay to fill that oil uh, two years beforehand as the available. Well, the Puerto Rican did. Could you, could you even single out? Uh, say, we want to get the Valdez, by golly. We, we're in the Valdez. Oh. And the reason we're doing that is we, by golly, want to protect that environment up there. Now, if you had a rational basis for protecting the environment, would that avoid a Fifth Amendment validation, even though the Exxon Valdez were singled out? Well, if it were if it were singled out on bona fide uh, objective criteria, not punishment, punishment can't be the, the okay. justification. And here, as the priest made clear, the Exxon Valdez was a state-of-the-art vessel built just two years before the spill uh, and used exclusively, designed and used exclusively for that trade. So there's nothing about the Valdez that objectively would justify it. But what if Congress thought there were? Isn't that its job? It's, it's Congress's job to make uh, decisions that are based on rational precepts. Uh, it's not Congress's job to, to make retroactive decisions about the application of law that can be punitive as it says. I'd like to close and save my rebuttal time with this quote from Langrath. The legislature's rest responsitivity to political pressures poses a risk that it may be tempted to use retroactive legislation as a means of retribution against unpopular groups or individuals. That's from page 266 of Land In this case, Congress succumbed to that temptation, banishing the Exxon Valdez from Alaska as an act of retribution against the vessel and its owners. Uh, we, uh, I, I will save my time unless there are other questions. I don't want to impose on your time, but you said that the Exxon Valdez was state of the art, and yet that terrible oil spill took place. Yes. Wouldn't that uh, be grounds for Congress saying, look, we just don't trust uh, these new vessels. We don't, we, from well, here on in, we, we don't want any of them coming in. Well, they, they didn't do that. In fact, the Exxon Valdez's sister ship, the Long Beach built at the same time for the same trade, has been on that trade ever since. And as the court knows, I think, or other panels of this court do, because there's been a lot of Exxon Valdez litigation in this court, the, the spill was caused by the heirs, the gross heirs uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the master and the crew, and it had nothing to do with the design of the vessel. Um, Would you like to save the rest of your time? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's see, I believe um, Mr. Stern. May I please the court? Um, before getting into um, the uh, doctrine of the uh, bill of attainment. We need to 
Try and keep your voice up, okay? I know it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, uh, that mic, uh, our um, acoustics are, are, are not very good. So. I, I, I'm sorry, I'll certainly try to. Um, before I get into the uh, Bill of Painter um, doctrine, I just wanted to go back to your original uh, question uh, to Dr. Bruce about the significance right. of foreign flags. It wasn't quite US clear to me in the um, vessel. Yeah, I think it is a little bit confusing. I don't know that it's critical, but it's probably worth my additional effort to try and clarify as well. And the, the importance of, of some of our discussion about it is this, is that, yes, generally speaking, all the U.S. flag vessels get to come and carry merchandise in U.S. coastwise trade. And that, that's a general sort of provision of the Jones Act. However, if a vessel is carrying um, North Slope oil um, from the, to the refinery in the Virgin Islands, which I believe is the largest refinery in the Western Hemisphere, that has been held not to be covered by the Jones Act. And therefore, foreign flag vessels can do that. And the commandant of the Coast Guard in the testimony that we um, cited, page 16 of our brief, had testified to Congress in 1983 that nine of 83 vessels that were carrying um, the like Prince William Sound were foreign flag vessels. And so that, that what we were trying to make clear was that it wasn't, that it's not only U.S. flag vessels do that. And since that time, also, there have been further changes in the law so that vessels that are U.S. flag but were not U.S. built can now also carry um, oil from Prince William Sound. And, and I'd like to sort of try and, try and in the sort of complication, sort of state something, make clear something else. There were several, there were also nine spills of over a million including the Exxon Valdez from the date of the Valdez spill until the enactment of the statute. So it's not just the Valdez, one spill, no others. Now, this was quite as it points out that the Valdez was the only U.S. flag vessel and that the other eight vessels were not at that time engaged in the North Slope oil trade. That, that's entirely true, Mr. Bruce. That's always very accurate. The point, however, is is that that it, is that nothing says that they couldn't become engaged in the North Slope oil trade. The fact that they weren't engaged in the North Slope oil trade, though at the time of their spilling a million gallons, doesn't mean that they never would be. There was clearly a way that they could have become even at, even under the state of the law as it existed at the time that this statute went into effect. So that even on the date of enactment on, of this statute, it did not on its terms apply only to the Valdez. And although um, the, the reference made to this panel's earlier unpublished decision, none of these points was we did not right. develop the record in this case. None of that we were there on a very threshold question. There was no cause for this panel to undertake any uh, investigation. Um, Let me just ask, what, what would be the rational reason for concluding that ships that spilled oil after March 22nd uh, were more likely to spill oil than those that spilled before? Well, Your Honor, I don't, I think that the what, that there are a couple of points to make. What Congress clearly understood, I mean, I want to be clear, nobody is arguing that Congress didn't know that Valdez was being picked up, you know, by this. Obviously, Congress understood that the Valdez was being encompassed by the statute. We've never suggested to the contrary. Congress also clearly knew that there were a number of other spills that had that had occurred. There was an epidemic of spills. Its legislation, as Mr. Bruce pointed out, didn't pick up all of it, but they pick up the mega org spill, which had occurred um, in Galveston Bay, so the mega org would be subject to um, the legislation. And what it basically, I think, did was to say, look, we know about the about, we know about the about these spills. We know there have been other spills. We're picking a number of one million. I think this is, you know, it's not, it, it, which is less than a tenth of the amount 
the Valdez actually spilled. And from the Valdez on, you know, including you know, and, and henceforward, that's the number we're picking. We're using you know, this as essentially as a proxy for if you've spilled it, we think that that poses a, you know, that you're more likely to pose a risk to a particularly ecologically sensitive environment than, than other vessels. Could Congress have gone back and said, you know, I'm going to make go back to the end of time, you know, you know, and sort of Mrs. Mrs. Bruce says, well, you know, there were four vessels in the preceding, you know, 15 or 16 years, you know, that, you know, why didn't they look back, you know, to start with those and cover them? Well, you know, the answer is Congress didn't have to do that. I and mean, this court said in Moore's Cove, and the Supreme Court said in Nixon, and this, and in Moore, and in Moore's Cove, this court was dealing with both the equal protection challenge and the business equal challenge, and in that case, we have a statute that was dealing only with one prescribed group and it was, as the court recognized, it was a product of special interest lobbying. There was clear legislative history that, uh, on that point. The court recognized that point. Um, they sort of said, well, you know, still there was a rational legislative purpose, you know, to it. That was sufficient despite the fact that it might have been a product of special interest lobbying. It went after only one group. They said, mere under inclusiveness is not fatal under equal protection analysis. It's not, doesn't condemn it under a bill of attainder analysis either. And the Supreme Court said exactly the same in Nixon. You know, I mean, the cases that say that are all over the place. The fact that Congress could have gone back even further and gone back before the Maldives just, I mean, you know, it just doesn't raise any constitutional implication. And that's what we're talking about here. It's not, well, should Congress, you know, would Congress have been wiser to take those four additional stores and move it back 16 more years? You know, that, that's really, you know, the Constitution really does require that. And you can't move to the assumption because Congress didn't do that. Well, it must really then, the, the entire point of what appears to be a perfectly well-motivated statute, really the only thing we can ascribe to this is a desire to punish to punish. It um, does raise the question of punishment. No, we think it absolutely does not. I mean, you know, this is a statute that does not only apply, I mean, we can, I'm going to have to go walk through the doctrine sort of step by step, and it does not at any point meet any of the criteria for punishment. First of all, the, the, it does not, even on its own terms, single out, um, you know, the single out Sea River. You know, even at, at the day that it was passed, it didn't only cover Sea River, and it's an open-ended um, class that stretches forward. But even if you thought that it did, you know, because Congress knew... Well, it's not a difficult argument for, for the plaintiff to make here, that it singled out the Valdez. Well, the Congress... Not, you know, <laughs> the date is pretty significant. Well, no, but Nixon, Nixon was being singled out, too. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean we, we, that would... <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, the, but, but even let us assume that, that the fact that Congress knew that the Exxon Valdez was being included. And this court has said the fact that you could know with precision who's being included, you know, isn't sufficient. But even when Congress names by name, as it did in the Fresno, you know, rifle case, or as in the um, SBC case from the Fifth Circuit and the two Bell South cases from the DC Circuit, where Congress said we're posing, imposing by name limitations on the ability on um, the ability of the former Bell operating companies to get into the long business. Yeah, but that, let's get over this and into the punishment issue. I think that was Judge Nelson's question. Uh, that, that's right. And, but there we clearly have yeah, I understand, I understand. That's right. So let's move into the punishment. That's right. We're, so we're talking punishment now. So the first for the first element is do we have historic do we have historic punishment? This is a, even assuming that, that you can, in some circumstances, have a bill of paper apply to corporations as well as to natural persons. The idea that a line of business restriction, in other words, for a corporation which is not in any way being told that it has to shut, can, can no longer operate in a particular sphere, all it's being told is what it can do with one piece of its property. And, and so you can't take one piece of your corporate property and you can't locate it or move it into a particular area for the purposes of carrying oil. The idea that that falls within the historically recognized parameters of punishment is absolutely without foundation. It is totally contrary to what the D.C. Circuit... Well, it is a detriment, but why is it not uh, 
punishment, a punishable detriment, if you would, or, well, or detriment, which is punishment. Well, because, because the court's really trying to tell the state is not everything that imposes a burden is a historically recognized form of that's, punishment. That's what I'm yes. I mean, clearly the Bell Sass cases, I mean, the, you know, the Bell companies are being told, you don't get to go into the long distance markets unless you do a whole number of other things that only in very similar to situation, similarly situated persons, you know, don't have to do. But what the D.C. Circuit and the Fifth Circuit recognize were line business restrictions, you know, that's just not it. Similarly, being told that you can't sell um, assault rifles, you know, wasn't gonna, you know, wasn't gonna count as historically recognized form of punishment. Even the Fresno rifle or the D.C. Circuit's um, decision in, in Mandicott. To take, I mean, it is true that the court has not applied that the notion of historical punishment wouldn't, but it really has in all of its cases. As the court, Supreme Court, I'm not saying the Supreme Court itself has said this, what it's done is that it's a, in the five cases that it's ever struck down a statute of the Lord of Tainter Grants, the Supreme Court has said is that it's essentially expanded to, to, to cover cases in which a in which Congress had acted to go after people for various forms of... M Mr. Personally. Stern, let's assume that there was a singling out. Let's assume that what occurred uh, was punishment. Is that the end of this case, or is there some other uh, way that uh, we would uh, could uphold the district court? Uh, no, I think we still then have to... Pardon me? No, Your Honor, I think we still then have to find an absence of a legitimate purpose. Yes, and would you address that? Yes. Um, for example, in, in the Brand case, um, which Mr. Bruce was citing, what I, I would point to, um, cited 381 U.S. 455, but what the court explained, and that was the Communist Party, um, sort of, you know, ineligibility for government employment, what the court explained was that you couldn't use this characteristic as a kind of shorthand for a legitimate sort of set of characteristics um, that would exclude you from employment. So that we would have to, in other words, you couldn't, and what the court said, we're not going to take, you know, this evidence of being part of any political party as something that we accept as being an appropriate category, categorization for barring you from government employment. Now here, what we have is Congress determining that a spillage of oil by a vessel of a million gallons or more should essentially be used as a proxy for it being less reliable, for being a re less reliable vessel to go into particularly ecologically sensitive area um, than other vessels. Now, the challenge to the major is not to that category generally, and at least for equal protection purposes, on page 44 of um, its, its opening brief, Sea River specifically said, well, no, we're only interested in the selective retroactivity Point. But the point is, the category generally is a perfectly rational one. And a spill that occurs the day on March 5th and a spill that occurs on March 25th are both equally reliable indicators of future unreliability. One is not more or less reliable. And again, the fact that the whole argument really boils down to, well, then why didn't Congress go back 16 years earlier. Well, why didn't Congress apply it to Monterey Bay or other uh, uh, sensitive areas? Well, but surely in Congress doesn't have to do that. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the, the, I mean, most of these tankers, to my understanding, you know, that these tankers go, that the only place where they really are, are, are very likely to go for the purposes of getting oil, you know, in the United States, as opposed to the Mediterranean, you know, is. Um, principally in the Sandy I can't really be corrected you know, on that. But whether I'm right or wrong, Congress can say, Prince William Sound has suffered a ecological disaster. We are very concerned about this area. We have plenty of evidence about this area in particular. We are taking a number of steps in this legislation to address it. One of the steps we are taking is a limitation on the kind of vessels that can transport oil in this area. This is a rational class of vessel that we are going to limit in the future. And there is absolutely nothing constitutionally suspect about doing it. And the fact that the vessel that spilled 11 million gallons of oil for the Prince William Sound is saying, well, that's outrageous. Me, of all people, how could you say me couldn't come back in? Seems to be turning everything on its head. 
I mean, we think of all people, what you know, the Exxon Valdez would be saying, well, all right, if it's going to apply to anybody, it should certainly apply to us. And instead, they're saying we could apply to everybody but us. How about the due process argument? Well, the due process argument, really, there, these are all variants of the same theme. I mean, whether or not the, the, the one regards this as being retroactive, and I, I would refer um, this court to um, Judge Reinhardt's decision in the uh, National Medical Center case dealing with um, the second concept of secondary retroactivity. And I agree that it's sort of hard to work through in a lot of these circumstances what's retroactive and what isn't. But what always, but usually this concept is important because what, what's at issue is um, is a statute being is, is a agency operating, are their regs operating retroactively, which frequently they have no authority to do, or am I, or am I trying to figure out in the absence of a clear indication, should the statute be given retroactive application, is this a retroactive application, and so forth. When we, in, in a circumstance, in all that there needs to be is a rational basis for the application of the statute. And that's exactly what we've been talking about, you know, in the context of the Equal Protection and Bill of Attainder. The class of vessels is clearly a rational class. A spill that occurs on March 5th and on March 25th are both equally reliable indicators. They're both equally rational as part of that class. It's not the case that if Congress is going to approve the March 5th, it has to go back, you know, in, back in time forever. There isn't a case in the world um, that, that says that. And it's not just the fact that the Supreme Court, you know, in seem like New Deal decisions, you know, wanted to take the court, you know, take the courts out of the business of second guessing economic legislation. I mean, it really, you know, it really just doesn't work that way. This is part of a rational class. And, and I think that that is the short answer you know, to the due process argument. They're all, it's really just one argument with three labels. I think that the reason not to focus on Bill of Attainder is a recognition that rational basis review is so limited. So there has to be an attempt to try and conjure up the specter of evil motive here. And there really is none, and it cannot be inferred. And I would just like to point out that, you know, other cases also, you know, sort of, you know, sort of, you know, sort of, you know, sort of have, like, not only sort of, like, to be unwilling to sort of, uh, sort of, sort of guess at, uh, at, at improper motive, but both in selective service and in Butler versus Apple, um, the Supreme Court and this court um, looked at statements that, you know, really were somewhat, you know, disturbing. Um, you know, that this is sort of, like, at least had some hints of, you know, bad motive, you know, punishment of Butler versus Apple. It's just that, you know, the, the felons being treated differently than other classes of institutionalized persons in terms of getting social security benefits, and there was some suggestion like that as a kind of punishment. Selective service was, you know, denial um, to um, people who didn't register for the draft of financial aid. You know, there was suggestion from some members of Congress that, you know, well, they're sort of getting, you know, what they deserve. And the Supreme Court and this court would say, well, you know, it's not on the basis of these statements. You know, even when we have them, if we're going to strike that legislation on the way of danger. And so there's nothing like that even involved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stern. Mr. Bruce, you have some rebuttal time. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. So, uh, there was a lot of stuff discussed by Mr. Stern of the, the Nixon case and the fact that that was in class of one. The court in Nixon was very careful, 433 U.S. and 472, to explain why the papers of former presidents weren't included within the, the statute. And that's because, as the court explained, those had already been housed, they were cared for, they were secure. The issue that the court was dealing with in the Nixon case was what's going to happen to these papers before they get into that custody. So that was explained. Of course, there's no explanation here for the um, trigger date that, that, that excludes all others. In terms of, of, uh, of whether this is punishment or not, it's not, it's not exactly like historical uh, banishment or historical debarment. But the Garland case is instructive. 
that's the one where the lawyers had to take an oath that they not fought against the United States government. And the only restriction in the Garland case was you can't practice in U.S. courts. This was at a time when hardly any U.S. courts practiced anyway. Mr. Garland, who was a lawyer, could have practiced in the state of Alabama or wherever he was from. There was no argument that he was going to deprive him of his livelihood or the like. In any case, the important point is the purpose of the separation of powers. The courts can't be trapped in these historical categories and never have been. You heard Mr. Stern say that Congress had to use the word determined, that Congress can't say what these purposes are for this legislation. Well, Congress didn't determine anything. Congress didn't say anything to support this idea that a prior spill of a certain volume is a reliable proxy for rehabilitation. And everything in the law, everything in the law that was in existence before OPA, everything in the law that was in existence since OPA, defies that as a rational explanation. The Coast Guard's never, never, ever been focused on that. Congress didn't try to focus it on them. As to the Bell South cases and the like, what's impressive about those cases is how far they got on the Bill of Tainter argument when there was such a clear bona fide regulatory purpose. When you read the Fifth Circuit's decision in that case, your decision in Fresno Rifle, the D.C. Circuit's decision in Bell South, you see immediately that the legislative history shows why the baby bills had to be regulated as they were. You see why assault rifles have to be regulated as they are. Here, if you consult the legislative history, it gets you nowhere. We mentioned in our opening brief the Howard case, where there was a separation of powers issue there between the judiciary and the Congress on issues of judicial subjectivity, being subject to social security. And the Supreme Court didn't take the government's proper ex post justification. It said, this is the argument of the Justice Department. It's nothing that Congress said in the legislation. We demand more. Here, the separation of powers principles that are at stake in every Bill of Tainter case really demand that of Congress. If you have a real reason, then say what it is. Put it out there on the record where it can be debated, so the courts can look at it. That did not happen. Your time is just about up. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the arguments on both sides. The matter stands submitted. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard this case on April 3rd and will rule later this summer. You're watching C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next, Supreme Court Chief Justice William Rehnquist gives the commencement address for Marymount University at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. Will the Honorable Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist please come forward? We are especially honored to have the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court as a participant in these commencement exercises. Chief Justice Rehnquist has had a long and distinguished career. His skillful leadership and his integrity have guided the Supreme Court through unprecedented events and have had a significant impact on the legal landscape.